because leptin blocks direct what we call beta oxidation of fatty acids. But it means that here now with MSH, your deficiency, you're tired. You don't have control of innate immune responses. You can't exercise like you want to. You start getting fatter. And as you get fatter for no reason, then you hear it again. You just need some exercise. It's not true. As we started looking more at MSH in detail, MSH does so many things. It helps regulate normal restorative restful sleep, and without MSH you don't get it. MSH is made with production of beta endorphins, and if you're not getting MSH, you won't get beta endorphins at the same time. Well, why are beta endorphins so important? They're the natural opiates of the brain. They help control the uh, responses to pain. So without beta endorphins, and without normal melatonin regulation from SH, non-restorative restful sleep, chronic pain, high leptin in your fat, low VEGF, you can't exercise normally, and you look fine. If your doctor doesn't measure your blood test, he says you look fine and gives you antidepressants and sends you to physical therapy, or more importantly, discreetly suggests you find a new doctor. The illness is simple to analyze. If MSH regulates cytokines like it does, and cytokine excess is present like it is, we should measure those, and we can. <coughs> we measure matrix metalloproteinase 9, MMP9, because that gives us the best information about cytokines. We measure PI-1. We measure interleukin-1-beta. We measure a whole series of things. The names aren't so important right now so much as knowing that there are tests that are reproducibly reliable, that are found in thousands of articles of peer-reviewed literature. This is not psychobabble. We are doing experiments right now where we're taking white blood cells out of the human body, putting them in a tissue test tube, and we give them a variety of toxins and we look to see what's called genomics, how quickly which genes are manufactured and in what order. And lo and behold, the order of those, those genes being activated is exactly the same as what we predict from the measures of these lab abnormalities that we can follow developing sequentially with, say, re-exposure of a mold patient. The biggest advance to me came in June of 2005, two weeks after Mold Warriors was published. It was already out of date uh, because what we had now was information about complement. Complement's another one of the innate immune response elements and complement when it's activated is like a whole string of firecrackers going off and pow, pow, pow sets up a mechanism to help isolate and identify and destroy offending antigens. And along that way there's production of two kinds of complement activation products called C3A and C4A. Those in some patients with biotoxin illness cannot just be produced and go away, they're produced and they're reproduced and reproduced and they ongoingly will activate additional mechanisms. C4A is the most important mechanism we have, activation I should say, that shows why people with Chronic fatiguing illnesses stay sick. I've mentioned Lyme, I've mentioned mold, I've talked briefly about dinoflagellin illness and chronic fatigue. The question I hope you're asking is do these illnesses all involve innate immune responses? The answer is yes. Can we use symptom recording to help identify those? Yes, in the fancy statistics we do now with cluster analysis and logistic regression, we can almost use a symptom profile separating his biotoxin illnesses from everything else with a very high degree of likelihood of being correct. We add to that visual contrast that adds to our diagnostic accuracy. Do all patients have the same symptoms? No, but as a general rule within this statistical framework they do, same final common pathway. How about visual contrast? Can many toxins set this off? Yes, the final common pathway. How about the lab tests? Do they all have MSH deficiency? About 98% of them. How about MMP9 elevation? Sure. How about C4A elevation? You better believe it. Can you get these tests done in commercial labs? Absolutely. Why didn't your doctor order them? If your doctor had, 
you would have the answer soon. There's one other issue, and that's genetics. Uh, in our group of chronic fatigue patients, we have published a particular pair of unusual uh, gene markers. Now, we call them HLA-DR haplotypes. And the name is not so important, but if you do a Google search on HLA-DR haplotypes, you'll find all kinds of papers. Right? Innate immune responses, together with MSH, they regulate acquired immune responses as well. If MSH controls innate immune responses, these control all immune responses. And there is a particular subset of patients with mold illness, about 24% of the total, who have the same HLA haplotypes that you don't find in people who go into moldy buildings and don't get sick. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And we know that if you've got a normal Lyme patient with a non-Lyme susceptible haplotype and he gets Lyme disease and you give him antibiotics, he's going to get better. Most of the time. But the folks, again, most of the time, who have particular HLA haplotypes for Lyme, when they get Lyme, over 90% of the time, they won't get better than antibiotics. And those are the patients who have the biotoxin illness. So, I'm trying to show you that we can profile your illness. I use the expression, we put your illness on a piece of paper. And a lot of people have told me that when they uh, get this packet of labs coming back after an office visit with me, that for some there's a sense of almost relief. That, you know, I, I knew there was something wrong. Well, there was. But followed up with that sense of relief, there's this uh, almost numbing realization, like, my God. Look what's what's wrong. And this was wrong all the time when you were told you were depressed. And when you were told that you were making this up. And when you were given a referral to see a psychiatrist. And when you were told that you were a chronic uh, complainer. And when you were told that you wasted the time of the internist by saying, I have more than ten symptoms, doctor. And he said, you are making this up. The paper was there all the way. We're going to show you other specific parts of the biotoxin pathway on this website. You can read specifics about each one of those. But as an overview, and hopefully I haven't taken too much of your time, you'll see that what we tell you here is based on high-level peer-reviewed literature. The opinions I express here have been tested in multiple courts across the country. And I have to tell you that the legal battles, especially in mold, are pretty vicious. And the uh, defense attorneys that I deal with are not dummies. Well, not all of them are dummies, but some of them are. Specifically, what I tell you is backed up by good hard science. And our challenges, they're called Fry and Darber challenges, our group has won. Physicians using my protocols over the country have won them. And we are taking the fight now to the very highest levels of peer-reviewed literature. And why? In the end, what makes the difference in this illness? It's patient care. Plain old family doctor, I'm getting goosebumps. Patient care is pretty important to me. It's what this whole illness is about, getting you feeling better. So come take a look at the site. I hope you like what you see. Thanks.